Teacher Professional Development Source Book. We are very happy to be part of this event to help um, bring attention to the work these teachers are doing. Evidence now, both um, research-based and anecdotal, that many teachers do not feel well prepared to respond to the growing diversity, <coughs> excuse me, in their classroom, both in terms of culturally backgrounds and, and learning needs. Uh, just from the work we're doing with teachers, we think this is a really essential issue for educators and that they maybe feel it more personally or with more urgency than, uh, than uh, administrators and policymakers. So in this discussion, we want to explore how the components of what we're calling culturally responsive pedagogy, as demonstrated by our winners, um, could help educators better meet the needs of their students. And to do this, we want to deconstruct the type of instruction and look at how teachers develop it. So let me introduce our panelists here. Um, we have Jacqueline Jordan Irvine in the middle, is the Charles Howard Candler Professor Emerita of Urban Education at Emory University. Professor Irvine is one of the nation's leading experts on multicultural education and culturally responsive teaching. Among her books is um, Educating Teachers for Diversity, Seeing with a Cultural Eye. Her most recent work synthesizes the empirical research showing the relationship between culturally responsive pedagogy and student outcomes. And Cynthia Hayes, say Hayes, I'm sorry, on the far end, is the Chief Academic Officer for Boston Public Schools. As a director of the district's learning programs, she is committed to eliminating racial achievement disparities while improving student learning results. For more than 30 years, she has served as an educational leader in urban, suburban, public, and private schools. She's been a high school principal, a K-12 Spanish teacher, a K-8 bilingual educator, and an ELL ele uh, elementary education teacher across all the bases. <laughs> For the past 10 years, she's worked with school systems as a transformational change uh, consultant. And we've already met Sonia Galaviz on my left here. And as you know, she's one of the teachers we're recognizing today for her expertise in demonstrating uh, and facilitating learning of all students. She teaches fifth grade in a small Idaho community that, like much of America, has undergone dramatic uh, demographic changes in recent years. So she's, uh, she's going to keep us focused on what's actually happening in the classroom. Um, so Jackie, let me start with you. The videos we saw, the great videos we saw. Um, can you identify in those videos some characteristics of effective instruction as borne out by your research on? Oh, absolutely. One of the things that just comes out glaringly is that these are good teachers, but they're not just good teachers. They are excellent teachers who go beyond what we think about in terms of good teaching. And that is they take what students know, do, and understand every day and try to make the connections, not simply to celebrate diversity, not simply to have a, a multicultural day, but they connect it for the purpose of gain, student gains and student outcomes. So that is, they are these bridge builders. They're okay. building bridges. You're making connections, et cetera. The other thing that comes out to me, you know, is that they know these students, the students know them, the students care about them, they care about the students, and they have the connections and credibility in the community and in the family. So one way in which they go about trying to figure out how to make the connections to the content is through these connections through family, through home, and through community. The other thing is, is um, the curriculum is multicultural. And so one of the ways of get, getting students engaged is to let them know that it's, the curriculum is about you. And I like your example you gave of saying, you know, how do you discover something that's already been there? And so these kids understand that. And so there are lots of examples. Of, but again, the issue of connection, care, concern, family, community, and understanding that these students do not come to school as cultural blank slate. And I also might want to add is, and I think I'm trying to figure out who, where I read it in terms of the application, um, but these teachers also know that it's a very promising pedagogy, but you have to understand that students are not merely products of a culture. They're individuals first. And so you can't make predictions based on what you see in terms of culture and skin color. So the first is that they know them as individuals, and they use that as an opportunity to enhance instruction. Okay. Uh, so, Cindy, uh, to follow up on that, when, when we mm -hmm. talked earlier, you used the term positive deviance mm -hmm. to describe teachers who embody these traits, which I thought was interesting. Can you explain that? What's, what's deviant about it? 
Well, um, it comes from the body of work of Jerry Sternan, and uh, he used the word positive deviance to help uh, principals identify those teachers who are especially effective at meeting the learning needs of uh, students whose uh, uh, learning needs have traditionally and historically been under met or uh, completely unmet. Uh, so a positive deviant would be a student where they may be the pattern of racial achievement disparities. And these teachers know how to accelerate the learning of the kids in their class. They assess deeply um, uh, coming into the classroom what the kids know. And instead of seeing them as uh, deficit or lacking, they just say, oh, I have to modify according to this learning need. And so by really drilling deep in the data, they can accelerate a child's growth more than uh, an annual growth year because they want their kids not to just be at proficiency, they want them to exceed that and get to the fun of rigorous learning. And so we can study a lot about how to do that by looking at those who already are in that practice. They're culturally relevant teaching specialists already. Right. They just don't know it yet. That's a good transition. So Sonia, you're apparently a positive teaching. <laughs> <laughs> can, you, can you talk just a little bit, I don't want to go too general, but how you develop these strategies that you use? Did you have a mentor that influenced you or was there professional development or was it just instinctual? You know, I had great, great mentors through my master's program and great professors at, at um, my college of education. But I think, you know, it was a hybrid of, of intuition and really listening to the family that they, they wanted, you know, me to understand where they were coming from. And they, they wanted uh, to be able to have an opportunity to share their stories. So I just took lead from, from my school families. And, and how long did you teach? I'm not sure if we mentioned it in the intro. Uh, eight years in public school and then three years previous in family works. So, so Jackie, turning back to you, on a certain level, isn't what we're talking about just good teaching in terms of knowing what uh, children are on a very individual level, getting to know their learning needs? So what's different about what you're, what we're talking about here as cultural it, 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 It's good teaching, um, and Gloria Latin Billings said it well. She says, but if it's such a good teaching, why would she so very little of it? <laughs> and that is good teaching, but with the understanding that the students who come to you bring with them a culture that's an asset, asset to be built upon. So yes, it is good teaching, but it's more than that. A, 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 a good teacher, for example, one example I like to give is, what do you do with a group of diverse students in the classroom? And you're, you know the content. And they look at you like, huh? What? I don't understand this. How many examples? This is, this is a cultural response to teaching. How many examples can you give that build on the everyday lived experiences of students who are sitting in front of you? Can you give multiple examples that tap into where the students live, where they grow, where they understand, not just to make the connections, just to make the connections, but you're teaching, making the connections so that they can understand difficult and challenging high standards curriculum. It is, I think that Dr. Holly said, it is a difficult kind of teaching. One of the things, though, <clears throat> I, I think that I, that I want to add is you don't have to be special to do this. You don't have to be a teacher of color to do this. I asked my teachers when I was you know, teaching teachers, what will you do if you were getting ready to go? The dean came in from the university and said, go out. You have a free trip to pick a country. Italy. All expenses paid. Go and get ready to spend a semester in Italy. What would you do? And I was amazed how they knew how to get ready to go into a culture that was different from their own. They said things, and I'll make this show. They said things like, I go to the library. I go see if there's an Italian-American community in Atlanta. I go see if I can find some Italian people in Atlanta to talk to them. I think I'll take a course in Italian. I think I'll go and rent some videos. I think I'll hang out with Italian people. And I said, great. But what if I said to you, you were going into an all-Latino school in this community, get ready the same way you got ready to go to Italy. So it calls for a commitment. It calls for teachers to be understanding, yes, I can do this, but first, I have to understand that I have to be a multicultural person and to be able to move in and out of these various communities. So yes, it is good teaching, but it's much more than that. Okay. 
so Cindy, in one of the videos, I can't remember which one, there's a principal who says, uh, you know, we don't have an achievement gap, there's no such thing, we have a teaching gap or an instructional mm -hmm. gap. You, how do you respond to that in terms of the work you're doing in Boston or you're seeing? Uh, absolutely. So when we take, uh, instead of defining the problem on the heads of the children, we really invert it and say, no, what am I doing that is not meeting the learning needs? Not, I taught it, but the kid didn't learn it. And I think that's one of the elements of really a, a strong, powerful teacher for all children with that cultural relevance. So in Boston, there's a number of different programs where uh, we've really shored up the scaffolding to say, as we look at the data and we don't have in a, in a majority student of color district, when we look at who's in the honors AP courses, uh, it's unacceptable. So putting a stake in the ground saying unacceptable, how do you backwards map from saying, no, all courses should reflect the broad myriad of children in our district. And so scaffolding and having a specialized focus to say, college really begins in kindergarten. So how do we link it all the way through with appropriate supports to say, uh, we're gonna remove the obstacles that children are facing and really tap into their brilliance but in a different kind of way. Uh, Jackie, one of the things we hear when we write about these type of issues is that how do you be a teacher, teacher who's really conscious and responsive of the, of the student's cultural background without defining him by race or, or even more stereotyping? Is that mm -hmm. a danger of this type of practice when it's not well understood? Or When one understands issues of culture and the social and cultural context of teaching and learning, and only to understand and understand it on a very shallow basis, mm -hmm. then you can dip into the area of making stereotypes about children. And one, one, one of the reasons that people don't want to fully embrace culturally responsive teaching is because they, their fear, the great, one of the greatest fears that race is like a four letter word in, in the community. We don't want to talk about ethnicity, race, and culture because we sort of are apprehensive that we might cross the line yeah. and make an area. And these teachers do so out of, of, of not, not because they don't want to embrace the kids' culture, but they don't have enough training in teaching to do it and to do it with confidence. Yeah. And so there's always this sort of fear factor, you know, hanging over teachers' head about, oh, am I going to make a cultural faux pas, et cetera. So what we need to do is provide more support for teachers in order to engage in fully understanding this. And with understanding is, yes, there will be times that you don't understand, but it's okay to ask the children to help you. And I think we saw, I think it was Amber who had the example, no, it was Katie, who was asking a student yeah. to help us understand some of your cultural traditions. But I think until, and it's not a, an issue that's solely an issue with schools, it's a societal issue. Mm -hmm that we don't want to deal with these issues of culture, ethnicity, and race, mm -hmm. because there's this general fear that I may cross the line, et cetera, but. I'm sorry, go, go ahead. On. Well, I was going to ask Sonia, do you feel that fear effect, or do, you, or do any of your colleagues feel that? Thank you for the follow-up, because as you're talking, Jackie, I'm thinking, um, you know, we don't want to address it because we don't want to wrestle with our own identities. We don't want to ask ourselves those hard questions, because, you know, we're uncomfortable with it. So until we have that um, internal reflection, until we wrestle ourselves, how can we, um, you know, talk about the cultural identities and how, you know, that impacts yeah. the classroom. Mm -hmm. So one of my colleagues said, you know, talking about white teachers, particularly who are afraid to go into the territory, you know, they're white as a color too. Mm -hmm. Everybody <laughs> yeah. has yeah. a yeah. culture. Everybody is ethnic. Everybody mm -hmm. has a culture, and to be able to talk about it and understand it. And when you can do that, your children would then, your students would then open up and talk about their own. I think mean, that's the point Bill Hawley raised in his uh, address was some educators are really adamant about wanting to be colorblind, that they want to treat all the students equally and without regard to racial differences. And there's a certain democratic ethos involved in that. How do you respond to that? This early. <laughs> Pardon me? This early. No. Oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> because. Uh, Colorblindness really is a way of perpetuating the very institutionalized racism and bias that we've all inherited. And sure. so I think it is a, a construct taught to really keep uh, white people unconscious. Because as long as we are still living very segregated from our uh, communities of color, we've gotten farther and farther away. Uh, during the DSEG years, we just co-located people at the expense of people of color, but nobody had any skill or capacity to really navigate that well. And so most educators are middle-aged white females like myself. And most uh, children who are uh, 
least served in public education are African American and Latino males, because that's on a, on a, a black white binary, the farthest distance. So until we can really say, no, I see color, I see my own and I recognize it and I work through my own social identity, my own racial identity, and I can appreciate the multiple perspectives and the wisdom that comes from an experience that I've not lived. That's really at the heart of transformational education for everyone. Um, so let's turn to the subject of curriculum, which I think is sometimes the hardest for outsiders to understand when you're talking about culturally inclusive lesson plan. How do you do that strategically? I know you've written a book about this. So what, what goes into that in terms of the hallmark strategy? Uh, one of the things I wanted to say, I think we separated the issue of pedagogy, which is the how we're going to teach it in the curriculum, right. which is the what we're going to teach. Okay. Um, I think that in the number of videos that we saw, the teachers were using materials where students could see themselves. And when they see themselves in the, in the curriculum to make the connections, it's very important. And one of the things about the lesson planning is, um, is, to, is to, to start with the build this notion of building on students' prior knowledge. So if you're going to teach a lesson in science, or you're going to teach a lesson in math, and I use those two examples because people always say, well, science and math is a culture. It has nothing to do with it, one's culture. Mm -hmm. But I know in Sylvester, in terms of your own work, you've been able to bring students' culture into the lesson plan. Uh, one of the lessons that I remember is a teacher who was doing a lesson on weather for elementary school. She asked the students to go home. I could talk to members of the community, particularly older members of the community, to find out their stories about why we had different kinds of weather. Okay. And they worked and they, they had a journal and they talked to people and they came in with these stories about weather. So example, for example, I don't think anybody in the audience knows, is an African American community they say when it's raining and the sun is out, what's happening? <laughs> 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 and so the other kids asked, what? And what, what, what the, 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 the saying is, and I think it's Southern, African American Southern, although it may be more than that, is that when it's, it's very massaging notion, is that when it's raining and the sun is shining, it's the, that the devil is beating. And they laughed and thought it was funny, but I think it's an important point because these things are passed on mm -hmm. from one generation to the other. So I can go to Alaska and ask a bunch of African Americans this question and I get an answer. And I can go to Florida and I can mm -hmm. get the same answer because these myths and things are passed on. So they use this as an opportunity to say, this is a myth and it's funny, but let's really find out this mm -hmm. and go back mm -hmm. and tell grandma what you learned about what happened about the weather. And so these sort of, <laughs> everybody was excited about their Mexico full of issues mm -hmm. about weather and what happens in different kinds of weather. And they used this as an opportunity to make these linkages. Mm -hmm. They weren't just memorizing facts about the atmospheric pressure. They were right. going out and talking to families and communities and using what they heard all of their lives, and they had mm -hmm. such a great time with it. So these are examples are if you just listen to the kids and if you value what they know, mm -hmm. and if you listen to the family members and don't think of them as the problem, but as a resource, mm -hmm. you can come up with multiple lesson plans that build on these issues. Mm -hmm. You just have to listen mm -hmm. so, and do, appreciate Do you have the specific examples on how you use the information you learn from families to oh, inform your lesson plan. Absolutely. I know you mentioned in the video, but are there other... Yeah, as, ja as Jackie was saying, you know, we, all good teachers know that we have to tap into the background knowledge of the student, and we're always talking about accessing, you know, background knowledge and, you know, foundation for understanding. So, uh, I guess I look at the classroom the same way. How am I even going to start when I have no background knowledge about the lives of these children right. as they're coming to me, you know, 33, 34 kids? So that's where I began is um, building my background knowledge of where they come from. So when I do the visits to you know each and every home, then I begin to build uh, that foundation within myself, and I start saying, okay, here's where some opportunities are to build a lesson upon what the families bring, or build a lesson upon um, the stories that I'm hearing or the stories that the families are sharing with me, which often. Um, you know, serendipitously, the, the families will come in or they will share. And we're able to build lessons and curriculum to where there are no right and wrong answers, it's stories. Mm -hmm. So everyone feels empowered to share 
and everyone knows that their story is celebrated and it's something that everybody can do. Because I think sometimes the culture that I teach, families are intimidated by the uh, classic homework that goes home. They yeah. feel like they yeah. aren't able to to help their child. Um, but if I'm uh, sending home projects that involve narratives and stories and sharing, then all of a sudden it becomes time to celebrate the home life and we're blurring that line between home and school. So I'd also like to just yeah. add one point. Is I think this gets at the, one of the basic problems. There's this misconception that all we need in today's classrooms, particularly if people say in classrooms in urban classrooms, are smart, content-rich people who are enthusiastic and who give children their cell phone numbers. <laughs> <laughs> but but we need more than that. Right we now. need people who are smart. By the way, you have to know your content. Yeah. But many of you have been in classrooms where people are smart and know the content, but they don't know how to make connections. Mm -hmm. That makes a difference between just mm -hmm. a good teacher and one who is a culturally responsive teacher who can connect the dots yeah. in the way that you talk. Mm -hmm. so, so it sounds like the kind of, kind of work you do, the, you all do, uh, takes an extraordinary amount of time outside the school day, outside of yeah. normal working hours. But I mean, this is this is the calling. This is the right. job, you know. And I I don't want to diminish, you know, the the work that we do. But I don't stop seeing my kids' teacher at three o'clock. Mm -hmm. So they they have my home contact numbers. They have my cell phone number. It's never been abused. They do it because they they know that I want them to mm -hmm. succeed. And if it means calling me at eight o'clock to get a little bit of help, then we do it. So do you feel? Let me go ahead a different way. Do you feel like the school? Uh, when school day is organized, and you guys can respond to, is is it organized to optimize this kind of work, or could it be done differently? Do you have enough time during the day, you know, outside of teaching? Well, we could go into I, that would be a panel into itself, you know, about the agrarian model of you know of our yeah. school, and that you know, long uh, long ago did we uh, need to re you know rethink the nine month school calendar. Right. If that's what you know you're asking, you know, of course, I, I always need more time. I yeah. think maybe you know the other teachers, we always need more time with with these children. But um, connecting with the home and knowing that the support continues uh, because I have the the families, you know, the families are on board with me and they want the success of the child as much as I do. Could I add to yeah, her yeah. point? I think from a school administrator um, point yeah. of view, I think we do as administrators interfere quite a bit with supporting the real learning process. So when it becomes, as you said, it's about the content. It's not about the relationship. When it becomes, it's about the business of school. So the structures and really deviating away from how do we protect that sacred time to um, unpack a lesson or to listen to the stories. Or instead of having it be conferences where schools say, you tell parents on a standard that doesn't mean anything about their kids, you shift it and say, how about listening conferences so you listen first and build a relationship? And then in the spirit of inquiry, you can share, well, here's what I've noticed and what have you noticed and how do we build this together to support your child? So I think the way schools are structured right now, it is in a very fragmented way. Mm -hmm. And the kind of business of school that we push into the classroom and into the schools needs to be pulled out and, and leading that time and, and really expecting that that time is dedicated to the children and families and learning. Big issue. Um, so I want to follow up to you about another administrative, well, sort of administrative issue, about a data mm -hmm. collection, which is a big emphasis in a lot of schools right now. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask, how can uh, you know, performance data, the segregated data, mm -hmm. help teachers in this in this mm -hmm. kind of instruction? Um, well, I think uh, we've been inundated with data that, and we have not really equipped, not really teachers or principals with the sophisticated uh, skill sets to be able to say, well, what's really meaningful? and based on what standards. Um, but I do think uh, data can be used to either perpetuate racial disparities or dismantle them. If we don't disaggregate the data, we can look like we're making improvements, but it really is uh, while the racial achievement disparities are getting bigger underneath. So we have to disaggregate data and we have to have it be meaningful in terms of, well, what are we trying to teach and assess, did I teach it well enough so a child learned it and acquired that skill, and if not, what about that content that is important and relevant? What do I need to come at in a different way? Not just teach it the same way and more of the same way that didn't work the first time. Um, so I think we have to kind of pull out the data streams and saying, what is meaningful 
for whom and how, and that's a different conversation. But I think data is at the heart of quite a bit of our. Yeah, yeah. Can I add to that? I, I, I hope you know we we don't become a a society of teachers that is you know a, that has data driven pedagogy. You know, I just want to say that I I feel like I would be a complete fraud if at the heart of what I did with my families and with my students was because I wanted them to, you know, only score well on Ooh, state standardized sure. tests. Yeah, sure. um, that cannot be the driving force behind right. what I do, uh, you know, and what we do as teachers. I really, right. truly believe that we are raising human beings here, mm -hmm. you know, and I have this precious time with them, and so it's so much more than that. Sure. And what, what the serendipity of being culturally responsive, mm -hmm. you know, teachers is that I have higher test scores, but that mm -hmm. is not the reason right. why right. we do what we do. Yeah. Do you use uh, data that's provided to you to inform instruction at all? Or? Oh, we, I use formative yeah. assessment yeah. all the time, yeah. my own, uh, you know, my right. own assessment, you know, and those standard, you know, state standardized tests that are often high stakes, as yeah. they are in Idaho, um, you know, they come at the end of the year, but I, I don't put any pressure on yeah. my kids. I'm like, let's just get this done and we'll get back to the good stuff that's happening in the classroom. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, Let's see. In the video, you also, I thought this was interesting, you mentioned your, the, the emphasis of uncritical thinking right. in this process. Can you talk a little bit more about that, how this helps students? Uh, well, Jackie mentioned just going deeper that, you know, surface level, level discussion on anything is, um, you know, something we want to move beyond. That's a, a skill set that they're going to need throughout their life. And um, everything, everything we talk about, you know, we want to talk about, you know, going, you know, narrow and deep and not so wide and shallow. So the students get very used to having critical conversations, and I, you know, I teach young children, elementary school t children, but they are quite capable of having those conversations and analyzing um, themselves and and looking at each other through a very sophisticated lens. I think. One thing she yeah. didn't say is that kids read 15 novels a year, some 300 and some 50 pages, and so she's culturally responsive teacher. But the point is, is more than just having the kids care and like mm -hmm. each other. Mm -hmm. It's not a whole class of race relations, although it's, that's important. But high academic standards, where she has kids in 15, not books, novels, mm -hmm. a year. And she does all of that and has test scores and data to support <laughs> That. And so we say, why don't we have enough teachers do it? Because a lot of people don't believe that cultural response to pedagogy has this is linkage to high standards and to um, to student outcomes, and that it's a high standard, rigorous. These mm -hmm. teachers use a rigorous curriculum to get these kids, and they're motivated by not just the data, but they recognize it. And when they teach kids from some of these communities that we're talking about, this is the only way. That some of these students have to be successful. This is the only one. And so there's a sort of a passion that goes with this teaching. And with every single one of the teachers that are here, we emphasize rigor. We emphasize high expectations. But I also let them know that I hold myself to the highest expectation. You know, they may know that I, I work um, as hard as they will. So. Do you have uh, former students visit you often? Or oh, yeah. I've gone to quinceañeras and, you, you know, Shabbat and absolutely. <laughs> oh, yeah. So do you have a sense, or do they tell you how, how you're benefited them? Or? Oh, well, you know, I, I don't know if they would yeah, describe it that way, you know, yeah. um, but the, the relationship um, that uh, the questions, the enduring questions, that enduring understanding, I get a sense of that, you know, and I, I keep tabs on a lot of them. Like I said, they've had my cell phone number for years, so I still hear from them, <laughs> you know, and they, I, I relish in their success, mm -hmm. you know. One of the pieces of research yeah, that's so over, it, it comes through time and time again, and that you see in the video and that you I read in the application, many of us in this room, is, and I think Ronald Ferguson, who surveyed hundreds of school districts, found that a lot of African American Latino students, particularly, are more teacher dependent than other students. Right, right. And then right. when they, they first have to know you care. And then you're going to be here next year. Mm -hmm. You're going to be around for a while. That you care about me. And a lot of them perform because they have a connection with the teacher. And you could see this throughout these videos. 
And so when students come back, you're talking about students who come back, you're part of the family, you're part of the community. And they want to, quote, make you proud. Mm -hmm. And they, they are motivated by that. And all these other things that, that go along with the research, you can read it in your packet. But the number one is care, connection, and concern. It rises to the top. And they want to learn because they think they want you to be proud. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are we ready for that? Oh, okay. We have a little, a little more time. Um, so, Cindy, are you? Uh, how do you feel like this type of teaching is uh, compatible with Common Core standards? Which are, oh, yeah. Can you talk about that? Um, I want to put a little bubble around Common Core standards because uh, we haven't really unpacked or examined what those are all about. But it's true of a lot of. Yes, but given that, um, I don't think there's any way that Common Core standards can really be meaningful if there isn't the culturally relevant. Uh, uh, instruction around adding to them and helping them to be real in the lives of children. And so they're also not the be all end all, but they are a way of helping us have an infrastructure, albeit unexamined, uh, for knowing how to help teachers aim towards something with children, but without the culturally relevant instruction that goes with it, the relationships, the realness, the rigor, uh, I don't think they really have much meaning. And I think it's borne out in the data that kids don't find any way to accept, uh, may have it be accessible, so they drop out because there really isn't much value in it if there's nothing that goes around it that's culturally relevant and meaningful um, in their own life. Okay, okay. great enough. Does anyone in the audience have any questions? We can turn to the panel. Yeah, in the back. Yeah. I was wondering, how do you get uh, the skills that you were talking about, the uh, power the skills then to pre-service training for teaching and service training. I think uh, you have a good story. I just want to ask you, uh, you know, just, just mobilize throughout the country and have all the colleges, all the colleges that prepare teachers to have this skill in one of the separate programs. We do it in teacher education. We talk about there's almost in every teacher education program some multicultural education class, <clears throat> some better than others, obviously. Personally, what I have found to be the most helpful is when I leave campus, where teachers can see the connection that these kids come from places where families care about them. These, people, these children come from places where there are resources and tradition and a history. And so one of the things that this gives an example where, you know, the stereotypic notion that we have to have active instructional activities for particularly African-American boys because these African-American boys, they can't sit down. <laughs> and I said, well, okay, well, let's, I mean, I have somewhere to take you on Sunday morning at 11 o'clock. <laughs> and, and I'm going to show you that they can. Mm -hmm. Why? They're surrounded by a group of individuals that care about them. Mm -hmm. Every person in this place understands what the rules and the regulations are. Mm -hmm. There's a sense of respect for individuals in this place. The expectations mm -hmm. are extremely high. And I said, you know, we can recreate these things, but until you see it, you don't often believe it. And there are places in this same church setting, which is a part of our mainstream African-American tradition, the same children who the teachers claim can't read and recite, they get up at the program and Christmas program and they talk, 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 recite, 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 because the expectations are different. So we have to not only have these traditional multicultural education classes, we have to have the kind of cultural experiences, not just for the student teachers, but for the faculty as well, many mm -hmm. of my colleagues, and I take full responsibility <laughs> for my end of it, who don't understand this either. So you can't teach it if you don't know it. So we have a, a question that came, right? Yes, we've got, we got a few good questions for okay. our live stream audience. And uh, one of them comes from April, who asks, um, how do you find time to do this and uh, teach the test era where texts are generally totally not aware? I actually had that remember. I guess it's Sony. Not for me. Yeah, <laughs> um, you make the time. You, you make the time. And sometimes it's before school and sometimes it's after school. But you're, you're going to do the work somewhere. 
you're going to do the work in some, in some way. So if I take time to do the home visits, I am saving myself headaches of trying to figure out uh, the puzzle of each of these students. Um, I'm saving myself um, the, the stress of maybe uh, the different behavioral manifestations in the classroom because I don't understand where this child is coming from. So it's just about reinvesting your efforts and reinvesting your time in different ways, um, you know, working smarter, not necessarily, you know, harder. And so it's, um, but it's making the time and realizing that uh, you'll need to attend some of those soccer games and some of those uh, quinceaneras and cultural events but that's the way that we, we make those connections and build a relationship with the family. Are there other uh, questions? Here comes the microphones coming. Hi. One of the issues that I've encountered when the conversation comes about cultural response and instruction is that people immediately revert to multicultural education. Could you expound on the differences between those two schools? Is that for me? Or for <laughs> <laughs> uh, multicultural education, and according to de definitions, of, I use the Jim Banks, the person who almost everybody knows in this room, that the pedagogy, the equity pedagogy, is a part of multicultural education. And so I don't want to think of them as distinct component. Because as I said before, the what you teach and the how you teach, all of those issues are part of the bigger picture of multicultural education. One of the, one of the um, but, but again, you can teach a multicultural curriculum poorly. You can teach about uh, the civil rights movement which would be a multicultural history unit, and not make any connection with the kids who are sitting in front of you. I mean, they can mm -hmm. stare at you with that blank look as if you were talking about uh, the, the European wars or the World War mm -hmm. One, because you're not making those connections with the everyday lived experience. You're not trying to draw on what they know about the broader concept before you go deeper into specifics of that event. So I, I, but one, but you make a very important point is issues of race, ethnicity, culture, multiculture, culturally responsive. We have definitional problems in the field where we have to figure out how people, because people, when you hear the word culture, you hear the word race, you hear the word multicultural, people have in their minds lots of different definitions. And I think that's the first thing that has to be done, we have to come to some sort of agreement about what exactly are we talking about. Can I maybe add to your sure. point? Um, I think the culturally relevant pedagogy, yeah. as I've been learning, um, when I was a bilingual teacher, I had the head knowledge, but I could still teach it in what I want to call a white normed way because I hadn't really examined my own experience and I hadn't really understood that there was other dimensions of me, meaning white as a color. So I think the difference, there's a, a piece of the pedagogy that is activist, that engages kids in dismantling the parts of the inequities built into the system because mm -hmm. we are critically conscious of them. And so uh, I think that makes it real, mm -hmm. and it gives a, a purpose that catapults kids really as activists into the future. And so I was kind of disappointed because it would have been easier for me to believe that multicultural curriculum, I was a big fan, big fan. But then all of a sudden, it wasn't until I, I really had that racial consciousness by learning um, from colleagues of color that there was a difference and I had had no idea. So when people say, oh, I, just give me, tell me how to do it, you can take any strategies and still do it in an unconscious yeah. way and you will make no connections, which is what I think you were saying. One of the things we haven't emphasized, this is social justice component. And I have an article in a, in a teaching tolerance where this teacher was trying to teach the kids about how to write a letter. And unlike the direction she was given from a mentor, teacher, or whatever about writing a business letter, she had the kids go, as an African-American school, go back in the community and ask the people in the community what they want the mayor to know about cleaning up this community. Mm -hmm. And she had them go and they interviewed and knocked on doors. They did it. And they came back and they wrote a letter. 
And she had the go I call it marching to the mailbox. Yeah. And she marched to the mailbox. She got stamps from other teachers. They were telling the mayor, we want you to do this in our community. It wasn't just writing a letter. They were understanding how to change the conditions under which they and their yeah. community had to live. And they dropped the ma the letter in their mailbox, and guess who came to school the next week? Love it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the mayor. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And they learned a valuable lesson about advocacy, the power of the written word, how to get things mm -hmm. changed. This is all part of what we talk about mm -hmm. in terms of cultural response and pedagogy and mm -hmm. multicultural education. Collective action. Well, and it's not keeping the curriculum at an arm's length, you know, absolutely. not keeping it out here, not only being head smart, but being heart smart, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. you know, how do we resonate mm -hmm, here with mm -hmm. these things, because they're all little activists, my goodness. My little <laughs> <laughs> Tracy, did you have a... This is actually a response to the previous question about the pressure for yeah. um, um, having your students to pass an exam, a state mm -hmm. exam. For me, um, one of the courses that I teach is AP World History, and honestly, I feel a lot of pressure for my kids doing well on that exam because if they don't do well, they may not earn college credit. Mm -hmm. So what I've had to do is to think about creative ways to get kids to connect to the course, not only for, um, through the curriculum, but also to master skills. Because my course, if you don't master certain skills, you're not going to do well. It doesn't matter how much content you know. You have to be able to master your skills. So, um, for instance, in the sample that was um, in the video, my kids had to do um, go to their communities and interview people. And then they brought those interviews back about a historical event that shaped their lives. And then they learned how to write a point of view statement based on those interviews. So I've taught a skill, but I've also connected them also with the curriculum and their community mm -hmm. and their personal yeah. lives. So I think that, that one thing that teachers need to keep in mind is be intentional, very intentional in why you do something. And is it also um, possibly addressing that checkoff list that you mm -hmm. have to get your kids to master, but doing it in a way where kids can connect to the curriculum? Thank you. Do we have, uh, Paul, is there any other uh, virtual questions? Okay. All right, this one comes from Twitter, and the question is, um, now what about when prior knowledge is missing? Um, what Irving said something about lessons that should be built upon students' prior knowledge. What happens if that prior knowledge doesn't exist? Every, every kid prior knowledge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Can't miss it. <laughs> When we talk about prior knowledge in teaching, a lot of teachers think it means what you didn't learn the class, the grade before. before. Technical. Yeah. <laughs> but every kid has a set of experiences and some knowledge that can be built upon to teach a concept. That's what it, that's what it means you know your kids to figure out what is it that you know that I can build upon in order to teach this lesson. And by the way, they do have knowledge that doesn't belong in the class. I mean, it's all okay to say. <laughs> no, not today, not here. That's not the kind of prime knowledge I want. But if, 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 if example I like to use, a teacher was trying to teach a lesson about comparing and contrasting. And before the kid, she walked in, the kids were looking at the cars coming in the parking lot. They were naming each one. They were grouping about where they came from. They were talking about different sizes, etc. And then she gets up and she teaches and she says, we're going to now talk about comparing and contrasting. So you can use a literary skill. And she starts talking about vegetables. Grouping like and dissimilar vegetables. Some of them which in Atlanta mm -hmm. she was trying to teach the cut sound. She mm -hmm. thought that she would show them a picture of a kale. They think you got collard greens. I don't even know. <laughs> so this is in the sound. So they didn't know what she was talking about. But the lesson was right what the kids were talking yep. about. Yep. She could have just as well used what they were talking about mm -hmm. at the time to teach the skill rather than sticking to the, the notebook and the lesson mm -hmm. plan that she had generated mm -hmm. that did not connect with them. So they know, a, by the way, they know a lot. Figuring out what they know, every kid has prior cultural knowledge, prior knowledge from other grades, and yes, that's important, but build on what they bring to you in the classroom. That makes you a good teacher. 
if I could add to that too, when I think about it, culturally relevant uh, instructional strategies, it improves the learning for all yeah. students because it's not the content thing about the cows. It's taking really whatever the moment is that the kids bring in with them using that. Yeah. So you have to be a really great teacher to understand what am I trying to help them learn? And then I use whatever happens in the moment and I can leverage that to make that learning pop. Those skill sets that are critical for, you know, to be able to pass the test and the, the rigor that we have to, um, you know, provide in the classroom, that burden I carry with me. I don't impose that burden upon the child. That's where the creativity yeah. and the cultural responsive pedagogy comes from, where I know where they need to be. But it's about living in the moment, like mm -hmm. you're saying, and using their reality and their culture um, yeah. and their world to be able to teach those skills. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the, and it is this, it's this puzzle, and it's a daily puzzle. And one thing that I learned, you know, in, in, in my program of education is that the pedagogy will always mother the methodology. If you focus upon, you know, the methods they're going, you know, or, or something you read in a book, mm -hmm. you know, it's going to run out. It's knowing um, where we need to move them, you mm -hmm. know, and being able to live in that daily mm -hmm. moment. I think we have time for one more question. Did you have a question over here? Real quickly. Yeah. Here you go. Here you go. Uh, I just wanted to bring in the uh, home language characteristics as part of the cultural portfolio that mm -hmm. kids bring. And I saw in the videos a number of really nice instances of using, incorporating the home language in very natural ways. And uh, one of the things that typically happens, and I'm sure as a former bilingual teacher, people say, well, we can't incorporate the language. It's not a bilingual program. I don't know the language, and so how can I do that? But I saw some very nice ways mm -hmm. of doing that, and I think it not only makes the connections, but also is a way of building the metalinguistic abilities mm -hmm. of all the classroom and, and giving people a chance to be exposed to different things and, and mm -hmm. do those kinds of analyses. And so I, I think that the whole question of, of home language and home dialect mm -hmm. being discussed in the classroom is also a, a very good thing and, and um, really appreciated the examples that were in the videos. Oh, there you are. Okay. Yeah, I guess we're done. Well, thank you to our panelists. Okay. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you, everybody. That was terrific. This is going to be a short 15-minute break, but this is a great time to continue the conversation during this networking break. This has been such an exciting conversation. I know our other uh, awardees have lots of thoughts on what we've just heard, so I hope you'll all just have a chance to speak. Downstairs on the ninth floor is where we'll be doing this, so if you just go down the stairs where we just came from. Um, and there'll be uh, snacks, and there'll be some drinks that you guys can refresh yourselves, get up, move yourself around, because the second panel will be uh, equally as exciting, I can assure you. I look forward to uh, speaking with you guys shortly. Okay. We'll be back here at about 3.45. Okay. Thank you so much. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. That was great. I think it's very wonderful. Oh, it's just, it's great. But you have to make sure you have to tape this down. Go downstairs. Down. Oh, is that working for you? <laughs>